There we go. All right. So I think I'll get started here. We will have this talk um, on YouTube as well. So if you if you miss anything, uh, you can always watch it again on on YouTube on our YouTube channel. So tonight we are very pleased to welcome Kathleen Fall. And Kathleen is a native of New Key in the Burren, where her family have farmed since the 1820s. Uh, Kathleen has studied history at UCD and archaeology at NUIG and at Oxford University. And she recently has published a local history book on New Key. And one of the many topics covered is the story of the Red Bank oysters, which is the subject of the webinar tonight. So I'd like to welcome Kathleen. Thanks for being here. And you can take it over. Okay. Thank you, Lee, for the introduction. And thanks to everyone for joining this evening. So my talk, as Lee said, is about the history of the Boron Red Bank oysters and also the story of Burton Bindon. Burton Bindon, who was a landlord in Clooney and the Boron and also an entrepreneur and who made the Red Bank oysters famous. So in the first slide, we see here a description. They were the most coveted item on the menu in 19th century Dublin's finest taverns, described as will be found to possess that briny flavor with shortness, sweetness and condition, which renders them one of the greatest and most nutritious delicacies. That was from a paper in the 1820s. So, so where does the name Red Bank come from? So if you look at the map here, the picture on the right is Trorua, which is translated as the Red Strand, or more famously, the Red Bank, home of the famous Red Bank oysters. So this is an island between Douras and Monia on Ochnish Bay, which is visible at low tide. And then when the tide's in, it gets covered. At very low tide, it seems to cover the whole bay. So if you're if you're driving from Kimvara to Ballyvohan on the N67, when you turn down from New Key, you will see this on the shore, um, off the shore on your right. So as you can see, it's got a reddish hue, maybe not that obvious here, but hence Rua or Red Bank. So the cultivation of oysters. So archaeological evidence shows that oysters have been eaten for over 4,000 years in Ireland, but the cultivation of oysters dates from the 12th century. Now, this coincided with the arrival of the Cistercians to Ireland. At the end of the 12th century, Donald Moore O'Brien, King of Munster, granted lands to the Cistercians in the Boron. They built the abbey in Corkham Row, which is just the other side of Abbey Hill from Trorua. And the picture of it, as it stands today, is here on your right. And the Cistercian rule forbade monks from eating meat so they needed to be located close to a ready supply of fish and shellfish. So access to the oysters at Trorua, as well as Paul Doody, which are oyster beds uh, located the other side of Bell Harbour, would have been factors in their choice of site for the abbey. So while the Cistercians have long gone from Cork and Row, their name, the place names, still has holds the legacy of them. This area here on the map is by the coast, now covers the townlands of Munya and Rosalia. It was known as Carrowillan in old deeds and documents from the 16th, 17th centuries. Carrowillan is derived from Carro o Muelan, which can be translated as the quarter of the bald-headed or the tonsured one, which was usually a description of a monk. So it's assumed to date from the time when this land and oyster beds were in the possessions of the monks of Kirkham Row. So to get to the oyster beds, the monks would have had to walk from Kirkham Row Abbey through Corker Hill or Corker Pass. So the name Corker Hill is derived from the Latin Carcer de Clericorum. And this can be translated as either the prison or pass of the clergy. Now, this is only a, one of a handful of places in all of Ireland with a place name that's Latin in origin. So it's dating from a period when Latin was the everyday language of the monks living here. So up until the dissolution of the monasteries, 
These lands, the abbey lands around Cork and Row, including the oyster beds, remained in the hands of the Cistercians. But following his split with papal authority, Henry VIII suppressed all the monasteries, abbeys and convents and confiscated their assets and lands. In 1541, Morrick O'Brien, who is descendant of the founder, Donald Moore, surrendered his sovereignty as an Irish king and accepted the title of Earl of Thomond from Henry VIII. Among the lands granted to him were all the abbey lands, which had been in the hands of the Cistercians of Kirk and Row. So if you look at the picture on your right, this is the, this hangs in Dromoland Castle, and it's a picture of Morrick O'Brien handing over his Irish crown to Henry VIII, where he's surrendering his sovereignty. So for the next 200 years, through the reigns of Elizabeth, Mary and the other Tudors and the Stuart Kings, including the Cromwellian Wars and the Restoration, the Abbey lands around New Quay, including the Oyster Band Beds, remained in the hands of various factions of the O'Brien dynasty. By 1730, these were in the hands of Edward O'Brien, second baronet. And this is a photograph of him. Again, it's a photo that hangs in Dromolin Castle. In one of the O'Brien manuscripts, the details of Elise in the 1730s show that Edward O'Brien, second baronet of Dromoland, leased lands to Bartholomew McNamara in Munya and Rosalia for payment of £17 a year, but to include delivery of 12 wagon loads of oysters to be delivered each year to Dromoland. So he obviously had a taste for, for oysters. In another lease to Nugent in 1715, uh, the O'Brien's paper stipulated that for lands at Rosalia, the lease required that the oyster beds were to be left untouched between May and August. So while they had access to the oysters, they had to ensure that the spawning period remained, uh, they remained free. So in the 1750s, having got into financial difficulties following his extravagant lifestyle, and he supposedly had a very a gambling habit, Edward sold the lands around Munya, Rosalia, and the oyster beds to Francis Bindon. So Francis Bindon was a member of a Protestant ascendancy family who were granted lands in Clooney in East Clare in the 1660s. This is a picture of him here on your right. Uh, he was famous first as an artist, and it was said that when his sight failed, he threw away his pencil and became an architect. On his death in 1765, his estate, including the lands and oyster beds at Munya and Rosalia, that he had purchased from Edward O'Brien, passed to his brother Nicholas and his heirs. So, the grandnephew of Francis Bendon was Burton Bendon, and he inherited the estates at Clooney and the Burn and the Burren on the death of his father Samuel Bendon in 1804. So while his family seat was at Clooney Hall, the ancestral home, he seems to have spent much of his time at the Burn, first residing at Munya Lodge, which is at the foot of Abbey Hill, and later at Cordon Rue after he built a quay there. And it was said when he built the, a lodge at Cork and Rowan, a number of slated houses after having the, the key built in the 1920s. He was noted for his skill in hunting and horsemanship, but he also put his energies into developing the land, the seaweed trade, building roads and a key, and the oyster trade and restaurants. So in the land development, in 1842, T.L. Cook, who was an Irish antiquarian, wrote a series of articles for the Galway Vindicator in which he included glowing reports on the improvements that Bendon had made to the area. So the improvements included a conduit to pipe water down from Abbey Hill to the road, to the main road. He developed the land from Corker Hill to Cartron by the seashore, laying it out in strips of 20 acres by tenant, separated by double stone walls, which are still evident today between the, the road, the N67 and the sea. 
In 1843, the then Prime Minister Robert Peel appointed a commission to research the problems with land leases in Ireland. This was called the Devon Commission. Among those who gave evidence was Burton Benden. And in his evidence, he claimed to have cleared 400 acres of what was sheer rock into productive land. He also reported that he had employed 65 girls for a month at four pence a day to clear stones from a field. According to Benton's evidence to the Devon Commission, land, land by the sea was much sought after as it allowed those le leasing land access to seaweed, which greatly improved the productivity of the land. So dating back to the time of the Brehan Laws from the sixth century, the value of land by the sea added the value of three cows to the average farm as using the seaweed as a fertilizer ensured a better crop. In his testimony, Benton claimed that as the landowner, he owned the seaweed rights. According to him, the landowner had the rights to the seaweed between low and high tide marks. He, had, he described how he had adopted a system of planting rocks and stones onto the seashore to encourage growth. And while the labour cost to him worked out at two pounds an acre, the increase in seaweed production gave him a return of between eight and 10 pounds an acre. He employed labourers to harvest the seaweed. According to an observer in the 1830s, they counted 40 horses with panniers lined up on the sea road at Monia, waiting to bring the seaweed inland for sale. According to Bendon also, the locals also were allowed to collect seaweed and bring what they could and take what they could. And he described how they carried it on their backs to Ennis to sell it to make a few pence. So in following a potato famine in 1822, uh, the British government gave approval to a Scottish engineer called Alexandra Nemo to develop 26 keys around Galway Bay. The idea was that this would use public funds, which would give local em employment so that people would have money to buy food, but also encourage sea trade and fishing. Benton applied to have a new key built at Cordon Roo under the scheme. However, to qualify, a site had to be accessible for boats at low tide. That was one of the criteria, which was not the case for Cordon Roo. As you can see here, this is a picture of Cordon Roo Quay as it is today, and it certainly isn't accessible to boats at low tide. So Benton used his own money and labour to build the quay himself. And the quay was described by T.L. Cook as the facing and general execution of the work are so perfect that it would reflect credit on the most experienced government engineer or scient scientific builder. So he was definitely, T.L. Cook was certainly a fan of Bindon's. So building of roads. In the early 1830s, Bindon got 14 magistrates from Limerick to sign a petition to the Lord Lieutenant in Dublin to provide funding for a new road from Limerick to New Quay. The plan was that the new road with the steamer's boat service from New Quay to Galway would reduce travel time between Limerick and Galway to six hours. But funding wasn't granted. So when funding wasn't granted, Bendon built a new road with his paid labourers between Cordon Roo and Crosheen, which was known as Bendon's Line and later became the new line. He also built a road which was previously a rough boring from Munya down the Bullock Dine to the lakes at Ballyvelehan so that he could bring his horses to water. So if you look here on the left, this is the Bullock Dine as it is today with the lake at the bottom. But the business that Bendon really made his name was in the oyster trade. He owned a boat called the Red Bank Lass which he sailed around Galway Bay and the Mayo coast, picking up young oysters, which were then put down to mature at Thorua for up to seven years. He told the Devon Commission that he had in the past employed over 20,000 people from Tralee to Belmullet in sourcing, cultivating and harvesting the oysters. And he employed 150 women from September to April, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. daily at threepence a day to harvest the oysters. So their job was to get the oysters, 
create them and get them ready for for a dispatch. So the, oyst the oysters were then delivered to Dublin every second day in the season. He also did deliveries to Limerick and Rosslair, hence why he needed the new road. He opened an oyster tavern in 1718 Duke Street, Dublin, where the Red Bank oysters were served. And in 1840, he opened a new, more luxurious restaurant called the Red Bank in Delir Street, Dublin. The main item on the menu for both of these were the Red Bank oysters, which were advertised for sale at five shillings for a hundred in his restaurants. Benton claimed that his oyster and seaweed trade offered the main chance of employment and survival for those who were not tenant farmers. He employed 400 labourers at 7p a day and said they would work for sixpence a day for him if he could guarantee year-round employment. And the labourers he described as taken from the cottier class. They were landless, but they rented a few acres of normally marginal land or what he termed mock land at four pounds an acre on the money he paid them on which they grew potatoes. He claimed that many traveled for miles each day to get the work he offered as it was the only source of employment. According to Captain Wynne, Inspector of Public Works for Clare, the coastal district all along the west coast of Clare prior to the famine was one giant conacre farm, where his families lived at subsistence level on a diet of potatoes, on the pennies they could make from seaweed harvesting. According to him, they were drawn it from areas inland and from the south because seaweed harvesting was the few, op few opportunities if you didn't have land to make, you, to make a living. So with the failure of the potato crop and subsequent famine from 1845, the cottiers or landless labourers, as described by Bindon, were the most affected. And with the failure of the potatoes, the trade in seaweed also collapsed, as if you didn't have seaweed, then obviously you didn't need the fertiliser. If you didn't have potatoes, the seaweed wasn't required for fertiliser. Uh, records show that Father Fay, who was the parish priest of Newquay in 1846, requested tickets for 400 of these labourers previously employed by Bendon to get work in the public works to prevent their families starving. And the census records show that the population of Monia and Rosalia decreased substantially by three quarters between the census of 1841 and 51. And then also in 1851, the parish priest of Newquay, who was then Reverend Coffey, claimed that the population of New Quay had fallen by two thirds during the famine years. So no records exist as to how many died, immigrated or ended up in workhouses. So we don't know what happened to them. One of the one of the requirements was in the census of 1851 to list the numbers who had died in the previous years. But obviously, if the whole household had disappeared, there was no one to complete the census. In Clooney, Bendon was accused of hiding up in Dublin, fearful for his life, as his tenants suffered. With his income depleted, because the landlords also found that following the famine, the rental income dropped, Bendon's seaweed income would have dropped, and there has been an increase in taxation to pay for the numbers in the workhouses and the numbers now needing help. So Bindon decided to sell up. He auctioned all the contents of his house and estate in Clooney. And a week later, he travelled to England and he sailed from Plymouth to Adelaide on board the Bolton. And his, his house and lands at Clooney, he rented out to somebody else. Uh, he was accompanied on the boat to Australia by two of his daughters and two daughters of his cousin, Samuel Bennett. Now, while many Clare people had immigrated from Clare to South Australia in the early 1840s, many in the hope of making their fortune from the copper boom. But by the time Bendon arrived in 1849, the copper boom was well over. So, but it was also quite common for the gentry and the aristocracy in England and Ireland to take their daughters abroad to the colonies on what were called fishing expeditions. 
that is for the purpose of finding them suitable husbands. If this was the reason, then the trip was a success for Benton. His daughter, Ellen, married Joseph Hall within a year of arrival. Joseph had made his money in insurance in Melbourne and was reputed to be worth five million when he married Ellen in 1850. The two daughters of his cousin also married within two years, but they stayed in Australia. So he returned home three years later in 1852 with his two daughters and a new wealthy son-in-law. However, his debts had continued to mount up while he was away. And on his return, he was forced to sell his property through the Encumbered Estates Court in 1853. So all the lands at Clooney, including Clooney Hall, Rosolia, Curtin Rue, and parts of Monia, and the oyster beds were all included in the sale. His restaurants in Dublin, Duke Street, and Delir Street were also sold. He managed to retain Monia Lodge and 25 acres in Monia. And then through careful manoeuvring on his part, the buyer of the oyster beds agreed to gift Bendon the oysters and a lease on the oyster beds so that they were put beyond the reach of his creditors. So he managed to retain his, his oysters. So within three months of the sale of the Red Bank restaurant that he'd been forced to sale because of his debts, Benton opened a new larger restaurant next door to the old one with much fanfare. He expanded his restaurant business with a new restaurant in Belfast, claiming that his oysters from the Red Bank were far superior to those of his competitors, which were sourced locally from Carlingford Lock. And he continued to source oysters around Galway Bay and harvest oysters at Trorua. However, the years of dredging and overcultivation of oysters was, was resulting in a severe shortage. He went to court in Westport requesting permission to extend the oyster season to allow him to dredge oysters in May. The tradition was that the native oysters were left alone from May to the end of August to allow the young to spawn. There's an old, an old adage, only eat native oysters when there's an hour in the month. But at the court, he received a damning verdict. He was accused of years of over farming and dredging, leading to a severe shortage of oysters all along the Mayo and Connemara coast. And his request to extend the season was refused. Furious, according to the court correspondent, he left for Dublin and without even waiting to thank his lawyers. But within a month of the court case, he died in his restaurant in Delir Street in Dublin. And at this stage, he was going on for his 80th birthday. So his heirs, or his, his legacy, his daughter, Ellen. In the years following her father's death, his eldest daughter, Ellen, with her husband, Joseph Hall, bought back her ancestral home, Clooney Hall, and 650 acres of the estate. They employed a top architect, Carson, and rebuilt Clooney Hall, it said to, was said to be the finest mansion in Clare. The house burned down accidentally and had to be rebuilt a year later. Uh, they were said to have lived extravagantly. And when Joseph Hall died in 1906, it was said there was barely enough money left to bury him. Ellen died in 1916 and the land was then sold to the tenants through the Land Commission. So I've got a photo of Joseph and Ellen in their old age. His second daughter, Elizabeth, she inherited the Oyster Beds, restaurants and Munya Lodge. She married John Copley Singleton from Hazelwood House in Quinn, six months after her father's death. They lived at Munya Lodge and continued to run the oyster business, including the restaurants up until the 1870s, when the oyster business, including the Red Bank Oyster, the beds, the lands and restaurant in Dublin were all sold. So the Red Bank restaurant in Delir Street continued to thrive. And when it finally closed its doors in 1969, was the longest running restaurant in Dublin, surviving since 1853 when Bendon opened it next door to the previous one that he was forced to sell. I believe it's now a hostel. 
So this picture was from the 1930s. So Troll Rua. So every year, Bell Harbour Point to Point is held in the land owned by Dermot Linan in front of Troll Rua. The story goes that Burton Bendon and Bendon Scott, who was another landlord in the barn, started the first races here over 200 years ago. And for the last 15 years, it has become an annual event to run this point to point here. So uh, this is a picture of the horses running. The tide's in, so you can't see through Rua, but it must surely be the most scenic uh, race course in Ireland. So Lee, that's the end of my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Kathleen. That was so very I... Yeah, you can leave that side up. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the uh, the chat there. Um, I don't think there are any questions at the moment. Um, yeah, it certainly sounded like it was a bit of a roller coaster for him. You know, things were good, bad, good, bad. You know, but he definitely sounded like a hard worker. That's for sure. And kept changing. You know, at first you said an architect and then he he built the key, built the road, you know, I employed all of these people, lost it all, started again. It was uh, quite a life. Yeah, he was. Yeah. But whether he was good or bad, I think, you know, I mean, he definitely exploited all these people. But then if there was no alternative at the time, you think, you know, was he? <laughs> Yeah. So it was, is it that he was, he underpaid it, as, as far as exploiting or? Yeah, well, I mean, they were barely living at subsistence. That's, you know, they could just barely afford the minimums. But then he'd said there was just so many people and the competition for land was so much that, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we have a couple of questions coming here. Where exactly is or was uh, Manya Lodge? Uh, it's at the foot of Abbey Hill. Um, it's uh, who's who's asking the question? If you know John, if you John know, Lamb, he yeah from Ballyvaughan. Okay, if you know Mary Purcell's house, it was behind Mary Purcell's house. Her house is Monia Lodge now, which is the second house before you get to the turn off for New Key. So it's a, I think it's an old barn at the moment. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't it it wasn't a very you know, a big house or anything like that. It seemed to be fairly, fairly basic. Um, are there any of their houses or their ruins still visible? Uh, I think Clooney Hall might be visible. It's but it's a ruin in Clooney. Mm -hmm. It was burnt down in the 1820s, but the ruins are still visible from what I know. OK. Um, is anyone harvesting oysters at Trarua today? Uh, there's a new company, um, Irla Conlon, I think is the name of the person, who's developing hatcheries and reintroducing the native, the native oysters. Yeah. And that would be the red, the red bank. It's no longer known as Red Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I don't know what the name of it is. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you, Kathleen. Love your book, full of amazing nuggets of local history. That was from Zena Hochter. Uh, Therese Kennedy, what happened to Joe Hall's wealth? Well, it looks as if they lived quite extravagantly. And I think he probably funded Bindon's reemergence, where he was able to buy this new, uh, build a bigger restaurant next door to the previous one and build one in Belfast. I mean, Joseph Hall was originally from Armagh, so I think that might have been. Uh, he purchased back Clooney, uh, but it, they had said he lived extravagantly. So... Yeah, frittered away. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any connection between the Red Bank restaurant in Delir Street and the Red Bank restaurant in Scaries, uh, County Dublin? I think uh, the people who owned it in 69 might have moved to Scaries, uh, but I'm not sure. Okay, um, very interesting to hear the history of the oyster beds in Traru. Thanks, Kathleen. That was from Mary Fitzpatrick. Um, Sheila McCormick, do we know anything about whether the oysters were cooked in their original 
consumption and then later maybe supplied and served raw and how this fitted with the restaurants? Uh, well, he's claimed to have delivered them by, he said, water carriage. So I think they were kept in salt water. So I think they were they weren't cooked. They were served raw. Yeah. And I think this was why he wanted to build a road so he could speed up the method of getting them to the restaurants in Dublin. Yeah, but they were, I think they were certainly served raw. Great. Yeah. When um, when you said the new line, I had had that come up at one of our staff meetings. I thought, what what is this new line everyone's talking about? Mm. Um, and then I saw the road. So it's interesting to know that it was once called Bindon's line. That would you would the locals still call it that? Do you think or what? Some oh, I, I think the name changed. Oh, okay. long ago. yeah. It was originally Bindon's line because he he financed it according to him. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, Kathleen, great. In your research, did you come across Dr. Robin Duncan, a, an historical and human geographer based in Birmingham University, then at Jesus College, Cam Cambridge? He did his PhD on Cistercians. No, I've never heard of him. Sorry. So uh, what's the connection? Sorry. Yeah, David Eager. Um, if maybe, maybe he'll he'll type into the to the chat box there um what the connection is yeah i mean the cistercians built most of the monasteries near rivers and especially in ireland but there's just a few of them that are coastal properties kirk and row is one but i think in france and in england they had a lot more coastal ones but being near water where they could access fish was one of the top criteria i mean they were they were noted Hydraulic experts, they redirected rivers. It was said that they redirected the bind so they could improve the fisheries and so on. Yeah. Very good. Um, I think that is all the questions for now. Um, if And can you maybe let everyone know, um, I know you had said you have a new book out, um, maybe touch on some of the other topics or where they could find the book uh well the book i have a copy of it here i don't know if you can see <laughs> it's uh it's available in new key um in sweeney's fish shop uh the russell gallery it's also available in ballyvohan in the uh spar and the service station in kinvara in the Eurospar and mace service station it's available in Innes Diamond, in Banner Books, in Innes, the Innes Bookshop, and O'Mahony's, in Limerick O'Mahony's, in Galway Charlie Byrne. It's available on Amazon online. Um, it covers 12 topics. Uh, the oysters is one. Uh, there's one on the Skerrits of Finnevara, if anybody's interested in their history. There's one on the famine in New Quay. Um, There's one on the place names and the origin. Uh, there's the Odolis in, in Finnevara. Uh, there's one about Mount Vernon Lodge and Lady Gregory in Yates. Uh, there's one on Peter Coleman, who was hanged outside in his jail in the 1820s. And then there's four religious themes, one on Corkmorough Abbey, one on Okmama, one on Patrick's Well, and one on the uh, Turlock, the fort of uh, Turlock Hill. Okay. Great. Um, Kathleen, could you um, end your screen sharing so they can see sure. you? And then if you want to hold up that book again, um, I think we're just looking for, yeah, so F-A-W-L-E. Um, they were just looking for your surname, how it was spelled. Um, and then um, David got back, he, uh, as far as the, um, did, if, he, if you came across Dr. Robin Dunk and he said, he lectured to us at Birmingham. I grew up in West Angsley and later lived near the Manai Strait with its oyster beds. That's all. So maybe just curious. Um, yep, yeah, and can't see the book. What's the title? Sorry, could you say the title again? I just, for those who... Okay, The History of New Key in 12 Tales. There you go. Lovely. So... Yeah, there was a couple of questions at the end of, about that title. So that's great. Well, thank you so much for um, for that webinar. That was lovely. And 
very fascinating to learn a little bit more history of the new key area and the uh, Burton Binden and the Red Bank oysters. Thank you so much. And I hope um, everyone enjoys your book that, that picks it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. All right. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. I know. All right. Bye.